Uh, we have everything with the projector ready. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Marie. I'm the assistant um, programming librarian here at the library. And I'm very pleased to welcome Kevin Hirschfield from the Cradle of Aviation Museum. He's going to be talking about uh, the centennial founding of NACA, which is NASA's predecessor. And when the library found out that this event was happening this year, 1915 to 2015, we thought it would be a wonderful idea to have Kevin here and explain about the origins of aviation and space history. We have some handouts in the back about June events. Also, we're going to be um, creating some July event handouts, so uh, those are there for you. And without further ado, please welcome Kevin. Hi, everybody. I was talking with some of you that came in earlier, uh, walked in earlier. Uh, again, my name is Kevin Hirschfield. I am the education coordinator at the Cradle of Aviation Museum, which is located on the original, original Mitchell Field Army Base in Garden City, Long Island, New York. Long Island likes to set, put Long Island in the middle of that. So Garden City, Long Island, New York, that's where we are on the original Mitchell Field Army Base. Located at our museum, we have over 75 space and aircraft, of which five are replicas. I'm just gonna go through a little bit of a cradle aviation before we do this, uh, which five are replicas. Um, we, have the, we have one of three original lunar modules left here on planet Earth. Smithsonian has one, Cape Canaveral has one, and we have one. Smithsonian has one, of course, because it's the nation's capital. Cape Canaveral has one because that's where they launched Saturn, the Saturn V rockets from and the lunar module. And Long Island has one. Does anyone know why Long Island has one? Grumman Aircraft. There you go. Grumman Aircraft. Those board, it was built about 20 minutes away from the Cradle of Aviation at Grumman and Bethpage. Uh, so we have one of those. It, it's great. It's, it's completely real, and I love it. So, without further ado, I'm going to go through this, Na uh, this NACA, NASA presentation. I'm going to go through the formation of NACA. I'm going, to, uh, talk, I'm going to call it NACA, just so I don't have to say the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. It's just a mouthful. So I'm just going to say NACA, and when I talk about NASA, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to, I know, we all know NASA's National Aeronautics Space Administration, but I will call it NASA, okay? So, celebrating the 100th anniversary of NASA slash NACA, except NASA was not around for the 100 years. First, it was NACA, of course. So let's begin. OK, so NACA was the predecessor to NASA. Whoa, too many times. I didn't do that time. Whoa. OK, so sorry. NACA was the predecessor to NASA. Obviously, this was one of the first, this was NACA's first logo. We get move up to here, and then we're finally to NASA. Not much on this page. So life in 1915 in America, there's a lot of technological, social, uh, a lot of different things going on. We have Robert Goddard's rocket experiments. We have one of Robert Goddard's models, model rockets at the Cradle Aviation Museum for whenever you have a chance to come visit, you can check it out. Einstein's theory of relativity, definitely something that was groundbreaking. S Sanger's new book on birth control, Panama Canal opening, and Charlie Chaplin took the cover of the July 1915 motion picture magazine. True fan. So, even even after all of this expansion and technological and social and cultural expansion, America still lagged behind European aviation. Yes? Could, could you turn the volume down a little bit? Yeah, maybe I can just take it off. I think, I think I'm getting recorded, so I'm not allowed to take it off. Is that better? Is this better? OK, good. All right, very good. So. Early American aviation, early European aviation. Obviously, early American aviation lagged far behind your early European aviation. So, America's answer to this was forming NACA, National uh, Advisory, well, <coughs> excuse me, NACA. So, we're going to focus on NACA first in the 1910s and the formation of NACA. Does anyone know which? It's too, it's too loud? 
Yeah, this is the first. Yeah, it's the first time I actually had a lanyard mic on. Shut it off. I think I'm getting recorded. I'm not sure. I think they might get mad at me. Um, I'm gonna take it off. Okay. Well, is this better? Yeah. Fine. My voice carries, so it's, it's yeah, nice. Fine. So, in 1910, a lot of things, different things happen, and. So, we'll see if, well, I'm sure a lot of you will know it. Does anyone know which president was in office during? Taft. No, not Taft. Franklin Roosevelt? No. Nope. It's a big question. I, I was saying, yeah, it's a big question. Who was, which president was in office when NACO was first created or appointed? Wilson. Wilson, Wilson exactly. Woodrow Wilson. 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 Mr. Woodrow Wilson. So, this is the first he this is the first meeting of NACA members. The first committee was kind of built in obscurity. There was only one chairman, ten employees, one of which was John S. Victory, that he was around for the, the for me, the whole time during NACA, he was around. And NACA members. In 1960 and 1970, NACA held the first joint meetings of the aircraft industry and government agencies in order to collaborate. Sorry, trying to find my place. Right, so conference meetings were instrumental in the creation of manufacturer aircraft, uh, instrumental in the creation of the Manufacturers Aircraft Association, I wanted to get that perfectly right, and in the recommendation of the American Product Production Board for World War II. So, even back in 1915, they, wheels were turning for <laughs> NACA, and Na NACA officially to NASA, the wheels are turning for technological uh, expansion during aviation history. So it's, we're working there. This is one of, this is the first Langley Memorial Research Center. This is the first, the oldest and first NASA, NASA and NACA research facility. Oh, by the way, everybody, I'm an education coordinator at Trail Aviation, like I said. I teach children. If any of this seems incorrect, or I'm not an expert, if anything seems incorrect and you want to share knowledge, please, by all means, I would love to learn from you just as much as hopefully you're learning from me. It was not World War II, it was World War I. For the American Production Board? Okay, I have to talk to somebody about that. Apologize, thank you. See? I need I definitely definitely uh, love the input. So, Langley Research Center today, obviously we're uh, getting a little larger, expanding. Now we're going up to the 19 to what? Did you have your hand up? Did you have your hand up? Oh, I'm sorry. 1920s. Pivotal impact during 1920. So, a lot of NASA's, NASA's pivotal impacts before the formation of NASA had a lot to do with the, product, the production and the testing of wind tunnels. In 1921, the first American wind tunnel was formally dedicated. However, it was, a, it was an open circuit tunnel. Does anyone, does anyone know what an open circuit tunnel was? It let, it let the air pass through and escape at the end compared to a closed circuit tunnel, which it would come back around and keep going in a circle. So that's, we, we first had an open circuit tunnel. However, we were, by, by the time we were done creating this one in 1919, Germany already had us up obsolete with closed circuit tunnels. So we're still lagging behind Germany, still lagging behind Europe, even though we're making these, these, these upgrades. Here's some more pictures of the open circuit tunnel. So you can see that the air is able to escape. Only scale models so far were tested in these tunnels, not actual aircraft, and we're not up to that yet. They're just only testing scale models to, to, check, to check drag cleanup, aerodynamics, forces of flight. Here's the control room. It was about a five by five little room that you were able to control how much air and how much everything was flowing through the tunnel in this right here. And here, we're starting to get to a closed circuit tunnel. 
This was the first closed circuit tunnel that NACA created. It was the variable density and tunnel, tunnel uh, arrived at in 1922. It's a new port, new shipping, shipping building and dry dock company. You can see how large it is compared to the, the people right here. When I first saw it, I didn't think it was that large. I had to pay attention to the, the, the people. So, here's another picture. Here's some more pictures of the tunnel. They're, now they're able to change the density, the variable density, hence the name. They're able to change the density that was happening inside and also how airplanes uh, how airplanes can fly during uh, very high atmospheres, atmospheric pressure. They're testing this also in this tunnel. And then in 1925, this was the, the NACA Aircraft Conference in 1925 that was that brought um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it brought this, it brought the government and the industry together. They were able to share ideas. And here's a really great picture. Here is one of the here's the committee members for that conference. Let's see if you can name a couple. Who's that? Lindbergh. Lindbergh. Does anyone know who that is? Well, you have it there, don't you? <laughs> here's my favorite. Wilbur Wright and Charles Lindbergh in, in the same group. Not Wilbur. That's not Wilbur? Well, Wilbur died in about Wilbur. 1910. Or, 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 oh wait, I'm sorry. Or, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Apologize. See, that's why I got, got the housing name. Here's another great picture. Who's that? Amelia Earhart. Amelia Earhart. This, the legend goes, I heard this story, it's a, maybe it's a myth, maybe it's real, hopefully it's real because it's a funny story. But during her tour of the research center, apparently a piece of her raccoon coat got stuck in the wind tunnel. I don't know if that's true or not. I really do hope it's true because that's a great story. Then now we're moving up to the 1930s. Mm. Simple impact of NACA during the 1930s. In 1933, NACA initiated the NACA Report 460. This was based on the testing of airfoils in their um, in their wind tunnel to see which ones would be better for different situations. And actually, NASA took the findings from the NACA Report over 10 years of information, they took this information and now they have the numbering system for airfoils from this that they used from NACA, they still use from NASA today, the airfoil numbering system. Everyone knows what an airfoil is, right? No? The air, an airfoil is the shape of an airplane wing. So it's like a teardrop and there's different versions of how much of a teardrop you have in this, air, in this airfoil. For example, these are all the different ones they tested of the same teardrop pattern. You just, you know, get a little thinner, thicker, decide where to drop it. Cross section is the early series of NACA airfoil from the report. And this is where this is how we still number the airfoils that we see today. It's still still from 1933. We still use we're still using the same numbering system. Now moving to the 1940s. If this goes by fast, we can try all this stuff. This is fun too. It's with the kids. The Ames Aeronautical Laboratory. And during the Ames Aeronautical Laboratory, the groundbreaking on December 20th, 1939, so a couple of days, it'll be 1940. Here, though, it was very important what they were doing at the Ames Aeronautical Laboratory. They were testing what would happen to fuselages and wings if ice. If ice, I move a lot, around a lot. If a lot of ice was forming on the wings. Now, if you were all children, I would ask you what would happen if a lot of ice started to form on these wings. We all know that ice on wings are not good. It will make the airplane heavier. It will not be able to have that lift it needs to achieve. So during this Ames Aeronautical Laboratory, we tested Oh, here's another picture of their uh, the crew, a view at the top of the Ames Laboratory. And here, it's a really good picture, it's very uh, high quality. This J34, J34 engine shows icing 
that occurred during research to find preventive solutions for in-flight icing. This work and subsequent, subsequent research through the years led to today's anti-icing procedures. So here's one, and now we're gonna go through. Here's another one. Mm -hmm. This is called the thermal ice prevention system they were testing. And here is now, we're starting to get a lot larger with these wind tunnels. I could have showed you slides upon slides upon slides of NACA's wind tunnels. That's they, basically they, what they did almost every year was build a new wind tunnel. So I skipped a couple and I went to the most large where they're actually testing functional aircraft, full scale functional aircraft, it was 40 by 80 tunnel. And I have a great video to see what happens when a pilot puts, goes into these wind tunnels during, uh, during one of the tests. Hopefully it plays. Oh my lord. This would've been, this is one of my favorite parts. It played in the practice. prior to test. Looks fine. <laughs> oh, now we're getting a little uh, faster with the velocity of the wind, 36 miles per hour. Not feeling it much yet. You see the flow's moving a little. Oh, 101 miles per hour. Still same subject. Starting to feel it. Not only did NACA test. Expected to experience uh, uh, this much wind, other than when they are jumping out of an airplane. Yeah, exactly. I have no clue. I guess it's just to make sure, maybe because they didn't understand how fast the airplane could go yet. They weren't sure, and I mean, a supersonic jet can't is always going to have a cockpit, so you're never going to feel that air. So yeah. I can't imagine why they tested why the pilot would feel that way in a 457 mile per hour wind. Fly that fast without a, a cockpit. Does anyone have any ideas? Bailing out. Bailing out. Yeah. Well, I guess yeah. Good point. Yeah, the cockpit. If the cockpit gets damaged. Good point. You, gotta, you probably should get used to that uh, feeling if uh, you're blowing through the wind. I guess. So we're starting to get faster and faster with uh, jets. We're starting to figure out how we can make. Jets go a lot faster, and there's a really 
uh, important concept that brought, let me just get the slideshow back, very important concept that was able to make the, well, I'll wait the beginning. It's a very important concept that allowed jets to go faster once jet engines were created. Does anyone know what, what uh, concept was able to make the jet go faster? Swift wing. Swift wing? Yeah, swift wing. I saw that with the kids all the time too. Much more aerodynamics. Swift wing theory by uh, Mr. Jones, I believe. Robert D. Jones. The first pilot supersonic aircraft to reach the speed of sound, Mach 1. The X1. All, this was at um, the, in Mo, the, the lead, the Mojave Desert, it was tested. Again, NACA. In 1949, the National Unitary Wind Tunnel Act enabled NACA to erect supersonic tunnels, again with the tunnel, at each of its three research centers. This is what they look like. They're getting serious <coughs> compared to that first open circuit tunnel that we saw back in, uh, what was it, 1920, about? So it's getting pretty serious. So we're still, we're trying to get as fast as we can. And that is doing all of this. I don't want to, actually, I'm about to spoil it. Never mind. I'll keep going. 1950s. This gentleman, does anyone know his name? was the one who created the, um, he came up with the blunt base, I, mean, I gotta get this right because it's a tongue twister, the blunt body re-entry theory that has to do with a, either a model like this, like a bullet, like an aerodynamic plane, how would it react to the speeds and the atmospheric conditions of re-entry? So during the during the experiments and the, during the experiments, he noticed that if you're very aerodynamic, you're going to burn up sooner or later in the atmosphere. In comparison to a blunt body, like for example the command module from the from the Apollo 11 missions and the, all the Apollo missions, and the new capsule that they're creating, the Orion, all blunt all blunt base, so it's able to withstand the atmospheric pressure. So we have a supersonic jet. We have the, we have the blunt base body theory. Now we have this jet, the D55 55B2 Sky Rocket, a rocket and a rocket and jet powered supersonic research aircraft built by the Douglas Aircraft Company for the United States Navy. So now we have supersonic. This jet is able to reach Mach 2. It's able to reach Mach 2, so it's twice the speed of sound. It was piloted by Chuck Yeager. Got it, nice. So, we have a jet re reaching Mach 2. We have the blunt base body theory. Where do you think NAC is trying to head? Space. Space, that's right. So, by 1958, October 1st, 1958, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration was formed. And the NASA stated vision is to reach for new heights and reveal the unknown so that we know, so what we do and learn will benefit all mankind. So, oh, this, I love this picture. <laughs> Obviously, it's a, it's a government organization, so they know how to save their money by just changing one letter in their acronym. <laughs> so, I love this picture. Maybe in the 1950s they knew how to save money. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you gotta take some notes from them. That said they do it twice today. They spell it once. So, the president that the president that was in office under uh, NASA being NASA being created. Anybody? Everybody. Eisenhower. Anybody? Everybody, of course. Boy, the Eisenhower. This was the final meeting of NASA before being absorbed into NASA. Right here is uh, Chief Blenden. Keith Glennon. He was the next. He was the first and next chair chairman for NASA. And Mr. P Preston Bassett, member of the NASA Committee on Aerodynamics. And Mr. Charles McCarthy, chairman of the board, chance vote aircraft. <laughs> Influences that led to NASA. 
I'm sure you all know the influence that led to NASA. Would you, do you just want to talk about them? You want me to show them Milton Bruin? It's up to you guys. We need all these. Well, that should have been right there. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, look, the transfer of power, obviously when NASA was formed, the reason why NASA was formed, well, in this sense, is that because NASA, they always, they always wanted to do the fundamental research. They wanted to figure out everything that was happening with aviation. Unfortunately, the government wanted them to focus on military aircraft and, every, and, the, and bug fixing in the industry. So, <coughs> NASA really never got to, they, they did in the beginning, but after a while they were being contracted to the government, so they didn't really get to do the research they really wanted to, to springboard us into the future. But that's what NASA was for. NASA was able, was an organization that was able to reach for the stars, no pun intended, and was able to finally figure, finally do, do more with the well, space exploration. So, NASA also grew from this, from 1915 to 1958. So from 1915, there were 20 employees for NACA. By 1957, there were a staff of 8,000, and the organization was valued at $300 million. So, NACA always, so we talked about the, so however, with the formation of NASA, the organization was able to focus more on the future of aviation and explore, whereas the industry, like Lockheed Martin and Boeing, they took over for the problem space for the immediate future, like all of the uh, military aircraft and everything like that. And NASA tried to focus more on space exploration. And why did NASA want to focus on space exploration? Sputnik. Sputnik, space race, of course. America saw Soviet Union launch Sputnik. They're very nervous. They wanted to beat. They wanted to be the best at everything. Another thing this does to the Soviet Union is that the teetering countries that really weren't really sure on which side to be on, when they see that the Soviet Union is doing this, and we're not up to that yet, maybe that teetering nation is going to lean more towards the more advanced nation at this time. So far, I mean, we, we beat them to the moon, so they beat us to outer space, which is fine. But we, we got to the moon. So Sputnik. Definitely was needed to, was def, Sputnik was definitely a very huge factor in NASA becoming what they are today. And of course, greater emphasis on space exploration considering the Soviet Union had a greater emphasis on space exploration, we do too. It's a cold war, we need to beat them. And where is NASA headed next? Is everyone, is everyone aware of the Orion spacecraft? No one. No, not really. Okay. So this is what I more. This is what I am have to research every day now because of the cradle radiation, constantly looking towards the future. So Orion spacecraft is the next exploration spacecraft headed towards Mars and an as and an asteroid to see if we can to see if we can actually get there. Of course, it's an eight month trip, so a round trip is sixteen months. So if you want to go, did you hear about that, how 100 people, um, that, that, that uh, competition to see how many, the 100 people that colonize Mars, they go and they never come back? I'm on that list, no, I wish. <laughs> but, um, so, <laughs> Orion spacecraft, here's the capsule. This is the capsule itself. It looks exactly, almost exactly like the command module, except it doesn't hold three astronauts, it holds four. So I tell the students all the time, imagine being stuck in a minivan with three of, well, three friends, I guess, three acquaintances for eight months, well, six, well, 16 months in total. So imagine staying in a minivan for 16 months with three, of, three acquaintances. That doesn't sound very fun to me. So the Orion spacecraft is headed towards Mars on it, the rocket's called the Space Launch System. They didn't really try hard with that one. So the Space Launch System, the SLS, is headed on that rocket. And actually, the Orion capsule was test, the, the test flight 
was last December on the 4th. They had to scrub it on the 4th because of weather, so it was actually on the 5th. It was a horrible time of trail aviation. We had 300 kids come to the launch to watch it, and they scrubbed it, and then we had 300 kids to deal with. And the whole thing was based on the launch. So the next day they got to launch it, not on the space launch system, but on the Delta IV heavy rocket. So this was able to launch. They tested the Rhine capsule itself for the electronics, the avionics systems. They tested the parachutes on the way down. Everything worked. So now they're looking towards going to Mars. I believe they're looking towards, I think, 2018 to 2022, give or take. They're still probably trying to work it out. And I would ask, well, I already told you how long it takes, but if I, if I were students, I'd say, is it always going to take the same amount of time to get to Mars? No. Why? Improve the propeller system. Pro yeah, improve the propeller but even, even yeah, an another the reason. The mm -hmm. Climate of the orbit. Yeah, yeah, the orbit, exactly. We need to know when Mars is closest to Earth. So if it's a little further, it's going to take a little longer. If it's a little closer, it's going to take a, it's going to take a shorter amount of time. So, but if we get this artist concept of the solar electric, electric propulsion system, maybe we'll get there faster. It takes the energy from the sun from these solar panels and transfers it into this module in order to power the, power the capsule. So hopefully maybe we get that, we will be able to go to Mars a little quicker. Here, New Horizons spacecraft, the new, well, it's not really a spacecraft, it's more of a probe. The New Horizon probe, is, any, is anyone aware of the New Horizons probe and where it's going? And it's actually about to be headed, it's going to, head to, it's going to get there in a month. So it was launched in 2006 to explore the Kuiper Belt. Does anyone know what the Kuiper Belt is? Kuiper Belt is the, uh, the asteroid belt that divides the rocky planets in the solar system and the gas planets in the solar system. It's, a, it's going to explore the Kuiper Belt. It did, it was, it was successful, and now it's on its way to Pluto. So it's going to fly by Pluto with the closest it will in July. So mark your calendars. Um, it was exploring Pluto's moons. I'm not sure if you saw in the news. Uh, the moon, the Pluto moon series, they were able to see really bright dots on the moon itself, and no scientist knew what it was. I was hoping for aliens, but so far they're going for, they're leaning towards gas, ice, geysers, uh, rock reflecting. I'm still holding out for aliens. But um, yeah, so the New Horizon spacecraft, and once it gets to Pluto, NASA's gonna reevaluate if it can go further. So hopefully that'll be a lot cooler too, because we never got to Pluto until now. And as soon as the spacecraft gets there, America will be the first country that was able to explore each planet in the solar system with a probe. So yay, America. And finally, this InSight Mars probe, this probe is a lot like Curiosity and Spirit, except this part right here, this is a drill that will be able to drill deep inside the Mars rock, the Mars surface, in order to, to test what kind of chemical composition it is, what may, might have happened to Mars, because we all know this Mars used to have life, used to have water, so it used to have an atmosphere. Now it doesn't, and we want to know why. Maybe we can save our own planet. So that's it. so it's able to drill into the ground and take chemical compositions. This will be in Mars, I believe in, they're shooting for 2017, I think they're shooting for. So Mars Pro, I'm excited. And then, geez, that's it. I know I'm not an expert, everybody, and I apologize if you're expecting an expert, but does anyone have any questions or comments or Anything? Well, you just mentioned uh, Pluto, and of course that's been taken off the planet. The planet. Do you know why? Well, because it's supposed to be gas, and I guess this, the fact that they're going and they're going to be investigating it, they're going to confirm. No, well, kind of they knew it was they knew it was rock. Everyone thought that Pluto it got demoted from planet status because it's too small. It's not because it's too small. It's because it doesn't. 
follow a regular orbit like the rest of the planet. The rest of the planets go in an elliptical like this. Pluto actually crosses Jupiter's path, and it kind of rotates like this compared to all the planets rotating like this. So they took Pluto off of the list because it has an irregular orbit. It's not even because it's too small. That's not even a good reason. Yeah, it's not a good reason. <laughs> Pluto's my favorite planet. So, uh, does anyone have, have, have any other questions about the cradle, about me, about these things in front of you? Tell us about the things in front of you. The things in front of you. <laughs> so this is what we do with the children. I wasn't expecting the, I didn't know who to expect for the audience. So if you want me to treat you like children for a little bit, I can. Sure. Give me oh, back. Not, sure. <laughs> we go. I want to be a tyrant. All right. When you say children, what usual grades are you? Uh, we, our sweet spot is middle school, but we go from kindergarten to high school. But a lot of, like a lot of the curriculum focuses, a lot of the curriculum for middle school focuses on space exploration. So that's why it's a good sweet spot. And we have a, we have a National Geographic Dome and Planet, uh, JetBlue Planetarium at our Cradle Aviation Museum. So we show a lot of National Geographic films and space, uh, something called space junk. You guys know what space junk is? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It's getting worse and worse. It's going to prohibit us from getting to outer space or exploring outer space further. So I, we tell the, all the kids that go see the movie that it's your job to go fix this for us because we messed up. So it's not only us. That's yeah, it's not only us, but it's, it's not only that. <laughs> yeah, it's true too. So um, I'll treat our kids a little bit. Sorry if you don't want to be treated like kids. So. This is like a living in space class. Um, we always ask the kids, if we're taking a trip here to the International Space Station, I always say the ISS, not in school suspension for the kids, the ISS, International Space Station. If we're all taking a trip here, what would we need to bring with us in order to survive? Peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And peanut butter and jelly sandwiches are food, exactly. Food, so we have some different examples of food. This is more of the Apollo mission food. They're getting a little more, uh, they're getting upgraded with the food. Now they have cans and stuff. But uh, here's some freeze-dried food. We have uh, rice and chicken, yummy. Pineapple drink, <laughs> yum. Cream spinach, beautiful. And potato medley. What's the medley part? I don't know. No hamburgers and hot dogs? Is that it? No, I don't want it. Um, what do you mix that stuff with to make it? Uh, uh, this is dehydrated, and this is, not, this is the next teaching point for the kids, too. They say, well, it's dehydrated. What's dehydrated mean? It doesn't have any water in it. So what do you need to do in order to eat this? You need to add water. You need to drink it out of the straw. We ask, why do you drink it out of a straw? Because you're eating it like a can. Where's all the food going? floating around. So you have to drink it like a straw, and they say, and then I actually have to add water. But with water, another thing we need to bring to outer space, obviously, we need to drink water. NASA, remember the NACA, NASA, changing only one letter? They like to, they like to save money. So I ask the children, <coughs> is water heavy? Yes. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes, it's, usually they're like, no, but if you have a bucket of water, it gets pretty heavy. You have more than that, it's gonna get a lot heavier. So say we're taking a space shuttle to the International Space Station, and we need to bring a lot of water with us. Water gets heavy. If the rocket, if the rocket gets, if the space shuttle gets heavy, what do we need to get more of or buy more of? Fuel. Fuel, exactly. So water, we don't bring that much water with us into outer space. Do you know what we do? Recycle. We recycle. And all the kids, they always, they're always kind of like, like, are there ponds or lakes in the in outer space? No. So where are we getting it from? They're always stumped. But where are, where's water on your bodies? Pee, sweat, tears. We need to recycle it in this water filtration unit. I always tell them if it's, it's, a, if it's a little urine flavored, don't worry about it, because uh, you're gonna get thir you're thirsty, so you need to drink it. So they they recycle the urine to as make it into drinking water. Yeah. Really? Yeah. And so that, that's what they would inject into the uh, yeah. into their food. To hydrate. Yeah, some urine into their food. Wow. Some it's, it's your dehydrated food. <laughs> Yum. So we can't bring much water, 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.
that they're feeling weightlessness. So I, I, this is my, one of my favorite uh, demonstrations. Yeah. It's, it's really easy, but they kind of get it. It's really difficult because they always come in saying, there's no gravity. No, there's microgravity. They're, they're, the astronauts are experiencing microgravity, not no gravity. But with microgravity, what happens with the muscles, of course, muscular dystrophy, you need to work out constantly. So we have different pictures of them working out. We actually, uh, we, we actually celebrated the, um, I don't know why I just thought about this, but it's really cool. We celebrated uh, the Apollo 13 anniversary a, couple mo a month ago or two, and uh, we had Gene Krantz, Fred Hayes, and Jim Lovell come to the Cradle Aviation and like do a, a whole presentation to me. It was amazing. It was incredible. But yeah, Fred Hayes comes in, and our lunar module, it technically should have been Apollo 19, so every time Fred Hayes walks in to the cradle, he always points and says, that's his lunar module, because he was supposed to go on Apollo 19, he said. So he always points at his lunar module. So he's a very nice guy, Fred Hayes. I didn't get to meet, I didn't get to meet Jim Lovell or Gene Kranz. I met Buzz Aldrin. He's uh, nice. Mm -hmm. He's a little, he has a little bit of an attitude. But uh, he's nice. And then I met, that's it, unfortunately. Oh, and we had a comic convention. I met a lot of those people. We have we do a lot of stuff in the cradle aviation. So this is kind of uh oh, and the last thing, clothing and shelter. We need shelter, obviously, to uh, protect ourselves. When we leave the spacecraft for an EVA or an extravehicular activity, we need to put on a spacesuit. I ask the kids, what's a meteor? It's a giant rock in outer space made out of dust and ash and ice. Exactly. If you know what a meteor is, what is a micrometeoroid? Oh, it's a little tiny meteor. Exactly. Do you think those are, they're, they can be as small as a grain of sand? I ask the kids, do you think a grain of sand would be harmful to you if it hits you? They all say no, but yes, because it's moving extremely fast. It's faster than 17,500 miles per hour. So if that hits you in the suit, it punctures you, you're losing oxygen, you're losing air pressure. So what do you think they make in the suit they use in the suit in order to protect from that. They use a lot of layers, insulation, they have some Kevlar, they actually have 44 layers, different layers. So if you are punctured, you have a lot of different layers to get through in order to uh, actually puncture your suit. So EVA, and then I, then I ask this question, because it's a living in space class and the kids always wonder how certain things work. So I say, this suit takes three hours to put on. You need to go outside, do your EVA, extravehicular activity. It's about six hours. You need to come back in. It takes another three hours to take it off. What happens if you have to go to the bathroom? Pee in your suit. What do you think they use? Diapers. Diapers. Huh. Exactly. But NASA does not does not use the word diaper because they're NASA. So they use the word they use. Maximum absorption garments, <laughs> or mags. I always tell the kids, don't ever go up to an astronaut and ask him if he wears diapers. <laughs> ask him if he wears mags, they feel a lot better about it. So that's why I always tell the kids. And, oh, and then we always, I, we let them try the suit. If any of you are brave enough, this is the astronaut challenge. You guys can try it out if you want. You need to put on these, uh, they only have two pairs of gloves, so they can take turns, but, Gloves, and there's a couple of different tasks. You have to put the gloves on, unscrew these two bottles with the gloves on, take them apart, put them back. Simple. <laughs> not even with gloves on, or without gloves. That's one task. And the other task is putting, a, putting like a nut onto a bolt, screwing it on, taking it back off. Another one is making a washer necklace out of string and washers. The kids try their best, they really do. It's very difficult because we try, we're trying to show the kids that with all this clothing and all this spa the space suit and the pri primary life support system and everything, the gloves, you don't have very fine, they don't have really great fine motor skills and a lot of, you need a lot of fine motor skills when you're working on these very technical instruments. So we let the kids put on the uh, gloves, 
see how well they do. Obviously, their hands are a lot smaller than ours, so it's a lot more difficult for them than those big gloves. But it gives them, a, it gives them an idea about how difficult it could be to even just, just use your hands, not even going through the rigorous work they have to go through. Just using your hands in gloves is so difficult, and then you have to do more. So it's a, uh, oh, and then we have uh, this picture that the kids love. It will say, how do you go to the bathroom in outer space? Oh, I have a mag, too. <coughs> it will say, here's our space toilet. And they always, like, I say, well, what's in this toilet? You always say, water. You think water's in here? I don't see any water floating out. So what do you think happens with the toilet? How do you think it go when they go have to do the business for number two? What happens? The vacuum. The vacuum. And then I ask them, what happens to it after it gets vacuumed up? They usually say it gets thrown out. It doesn't. It gets freeze treated and brought back to Earth. So we don't want to get rid of our garbage in outer space. We want to bring it back to Earth and get rid of our garbage. We don't have enough. So, space toilet. And then a lot of people ask, how, a lot of kids ask, how do they take showers? Because they, well, I always kind of prompt them too. I say, well, how do you take a shower? Isn't the water coming from above? What happens when you're in microgravity? Is it going to fall on you? No. So, you go into a tube, like a curtain around you, and water jet, mist of like water jets come up from above. And I had an amazing question from a child that I still have to do some research on. He asked, well, when you're washing yourself with soap and all the water with the jets, isn't that just kind of floating off of you? How are you getting clean? That was, a good, that was a good point by that kid, and I still have to search it. But that's my living with space spiel, my NASA, NASA spiel. Um, any more questions? I can always go through the slides again. Yes. Question. Do you know, has NASA ever been hit by space junk during spacewalk? By, you know, by, uh, like in the movie Gravity? Yeah. Um, not to my knowledge. No. The only thing that, the only thing that's happening with space junk is that every time you go, even like, like, um, satellites are, are not working anymore. They're hitting into each other. And then this debris flies around and then a, like a, even a little paint chip hits, hits into something else and it just keeps going and keeps going. It's just like, it's just, it's larger and larger and larger until we have just this atmosphere of space junk. So, so what they're, they're working on right now is that there, there's this concept of uh, having recyclable trucks or like recyclable like space shuttles, I guess picking up all this garbage and having like a recycling plant, like an international space station. That's one concept. Another one is uh, a large fisherman's net, basically. You can all see this in the movie Space Junk, a large fisherman net that just collects all the metal and the debris and everything. That's another concept. Um, I'm sure it's a lot more difficult than they're going to, well, they know it's difficult, but I think that they have more of a fiscal tax than maybe they think they do. Because if you want to go to Mars, and then there's another concept to go to Venus, to this is really this is a real concept, like not even planning stage yet. This concept where it's kind of like in the movie Star Wars, they want to make like a above a cloud city, or it's like study it at least because the Venus atmosphere, very high above, is the most suitable for humans. But if you go any lower, the pressure gets way too heavy. So they can't, you can't survive. So what we're trying to do is have like these, basically these helium blimps, like Zeppelins, to fly around and test, exactly. So this, and then they have another concept of a submarine going to one of the moons of Jupiter. If, one, if someone's saying that Saturn, Jupiter, one of the moons that probably has the water, I think it's Titan, I think it's Titan. They want to send us a submarine to go under and see if there's any life under the surface. This is all concept, real concept. The things I showed you, that's the planning stages. Orion, they already, they already test launch. InSight, they're already working on. The space propulsion, that's a little more concept. And then New Horizons, it's already there. It's on its way to Pluto as we speak. So, um, any more questions or anything? Yes. What, do you, what are your center's hours of operation and cost to visit? Oh, perfect. Uh, we are open nine. 30 to 5. During the summer, we're open Monday through Sunday. Uh, during the 
school season, we're not open Mondays, and it depends on what you want to do at the museum. If you just want to take, just get regular admission, that is $14 for an adult, and it's like a $6 for a kid. Uh, if you want to go to the museum, then we have a planetarium, so that's like a joint combo ticket. And then we also have a firefighter's museum. That is another joint ticket. So there's a lot of different things you could do. Oh, then, you, then you can go on our flight simulator. That's another. Uh -oh. There's a lot of different things to do. Is that like the Disney? Um, what was the name of that ride? What? The Mission to Space. The Mission to Space. Nah, it's not. Disney is crazy with money. We are non for profit, so our ex, it's called an X ride, and it feels like you're flying with the Blue Angels. Huh? It's pretty cool. It's I would definitely wouldn't say it's as advanced as Disney, but. That's unfortunate. I wish we were Disney. Um, anything else at the museum? We have a lot of expos and different kinds of um, conferences and seminars. We've had Buzz Aldrin and all of them come and talk. Um, many of our docents and volunteers are Grumman retirees. Wow. So it's amazing that the, when visitors come in, they want to ask about all these different aircraft. You can go up to someone that probably built it. Had to help yeah. build it. Yeah. So that's a really great part of it. Yes? I know you've got a, uh, a look alike at least for the Spirit of St. Louis. Right. What was, what's the genesis of how, what that one was, where it was built, when, and how you got it? Okay. Um, I could tell you what exactly it is. Uh, it's, so the Spirit of St. Louis, it's not a replica. You tell the students it's not a replica. It's called a sister ship. So it was built by the same company that built the Spirit of St. Louis with Charles Lindbergh. And after they saw that Charles Lindbergh was able to fly transatlantically, they built more. So our Spirit of St. Louis is a sister ship. And ours is a movie star, because have you guys seen uh, Spirit of St. Louis with Jimmy Stewart? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's our one. Oh, so the plane he flies is that one. I don't know when exactly it was built. I don't know how he came across it. I need to talk to my curator. Um, I just know that it's not a replica, it's a sister ship, flown by Jimmy Stewart. And uh, it doesn't have a windshield. The kids never understand why. And I tell them you don't have to see in front of you when there's no other planes around. <laughs> you only need to see down. You only need to look out the, the back or a periscope and you can land to take off. <laughs> Otherwise, there's no aircraft carriers. There's no uh, there's no other planes flying around. So you don't have to worry about anything. And it took uh, 33 and a half hours for them to get there. So we brought a couple sandwiches. They always ask how I went to the bathroom. I actually never knew how I went to the bathroom. You guys know how he went to, how he went to the bathroom? I don't either. <laughs> you didn't? Uh, I guess you could talk about 33 and a half hours, right? I think you can tell the tale. I was going to ask, did any of the children or grandchildren of the Lindbergh family ever go there? Because they had family in, or they had family mm -hmm. in Connecticut, but also in Vermont. If they have, they probably told the Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong actually came to our museum, but he didn't tell anybody he was coming. Wow. And if they did, he didn't probably tell anyone, the family didn't tell any, anyone he was coming. But we tried to invite, before he passed away, Neil Armstrong, we tried to invite him to the Cradle of Aviation, and he called, he emailed back saying, I've already been there, what are you talking about? <laughs> he just <laughs> bought a ticket, walked through by himself, checked everything out and left. Because no one knew he was here. Oh, and Michael Buble actually came to the Cradle of Aviation a few days ago. A lot, of, uh, a lot of celebrities show up. Anything else? Any other questions? We have an original uh, Nellie's Carousel from 1900s. Yeah. There's a lot of different things. And the Children's Museum is down the road. Uh, Nassau Coliseum, where the Islanders play, is literally right across the street. Um, wow. Can't think of anything else. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I'm sorry uh, if you were expecting a more of an expert in the NACA. Do you have any <laughs> words about the uh, museum? You know what? I 